All right, now we're recording. So I don't have to tell you my chemistry joke again that doesn't ever get a reaction. Okay, we're talking about sexy stuff. Uh, we're talking about this. We're talking about converting suburban and urban lawns to more sustainable natural native plant landscapes that do a lot more for envi our environment, least of which is supporting wildlife and most of which, which is probably giving um, our landscapes, our, our kids healthier landscapes to play in. So this map shows, so all the green on this map is all the lawn that's in the United States, okay? So if you put, smush all this green together, that's about the size of the entire state of Georgia. You can see there on the bottom, just how much water we're using. 20 trillion gallons uh, of water used to irrigate lawns every year, whereas we're using 30 trillion gallons to irrigate uh, all of our crops in the United States. So that 20 trillion is a lot. It's two thirds of what we're, what, what we're using to, to feed ourselves with or feed our cows and chickens with. And we're basically just throwing that 20 trillion gallons uh, of, of water away. Um, you know, we, we are definitely gonna be facing water wars with climate change, no doubt about it. So some of this stuff I'm sure you guys already know, but and I'm usually preaching to the choir, so I shall preach some more today. Um, of 30 commonly used lawn pesticides, 19 are linked to cancer, 13 to birth defects, 21 to reproductive disorders, 15 to brain damage, and I'm sure there's a lot more nasty fun stuff that we could have on there. Of those, 17 are detected in groundwater, 11 toxic to bees, 16 toxic to birds. Idling a leaf blower for 10 minutes produces as much toxic exhaust as driving a large uh, pickup truck uh, for 235 miles. So like a Chevy Silverado or Ford F-150 or something like that. So our lawn equipment, our, our landscape management equipment that is fossil fuel powered is, is incredibly bad for the environment. Now, less than 2% of the original tall grass prairie uh, remains, it, making that more threatened uh, than the Amazon and Indonesian rainforest combined. 70% of all US grasslands may be gone by 2100. I made no promise that this was a happy, happy talk. There'll be happy things, but because you're going to get in power today. So this is one map that shows the original extent of the Great Plains. There are some that have uh, things poking a little bit more east. Uh, this is generally what I go by uh, with what used to be, what was uh, before European colonization set in. Brown is everything that's been converted. So you can see that is a lot. You do not want to live in Iowa or Illinois for many reasons. <laughs> oh, no, that's not good. Uh, so dark green on this map is everything that's somewhat intact, relatively intact. You can see the Flint Hills there in eastern Kansas, the Sand Hills up there uh, in Nebraska. And I think North Dakota and South Dakota are probably in a lot worse shape now uh, than they were when this map was created way back in 2015. Now there's prairie, there's grasslands, there's meadow everywhere. I always get folks, especially with my new book saying, is this book applicable to me? Because it was published from the University of Illinois Press and you live in Nebraska. And I'm like, yeah, because um, number one, if you have a lawn, you already have a meadow, you already have a grassland in, in the waiting, in the making. Um, and, and we also have these ecosystems all around the country. They just have different plant communities and, and different uh, you know, um, acclimations that they have to their region. We've got grasslands in the Southeast. Um, oh, I should have had the more detailed map on here, but there's, this is broken down into a lot of uh, more, uh, more discrete ecosystem, eco regions. Uh, we even have prairie or what's left of it in the Hempstead Plains in, in Long Island. Um, Hempstead Plains is, you know, it's mostly now all suburbs, but there's still a little bit of remnant left there. Now, this is something else you probably already know. Native plants provide 15 to 35 times the caterpillar biomass versus exotics. They support 3,500 or 3,500 native bee species that have longer flight times than exotic honeybees, provide, and they provide specific pollination like buzz, which increases fruit yield, quality, and shelf life. Um, so if you like almonds and blueberries and strawberries, you want to have as many native bees in your landscape as possible, which means you want to have a diversity uh, of flowers blooming at all times during the growing season. Native plants are adapted to local and regional climate. Uh, their blooms are in sync with emerging insects. They support specialist insects that require leaves or pollen to feed their young. You know, we have we all know about monarch butterflies and milkweed, but that that those in, that kind of specialist interaction is repeated hundreds and thousands of times, um, not just with larvae feeding on the leaves, but we have specialist native bees who rely on the pollen of certain uh, family, uh, genus, even species of native plants um, to to feed their young. Now, kids today see 35% fewer butterflies and moss than their parents did 40 years ago. 
We currently have 50% fewer birds than 40 years ago. 235 of our North American bird species are at risk of extinction within the coming decades. And 96% of songbirds feed only insects to their young. So I know we have a lot of bird watchers here. I, um, so many of my friends are bird watchers. And if you want the birds, you want the native plants that are creating the insects that these birds feed to their young because who is a garden for, right? It's not just for us, it's for all of these specialist insects shown here. And if you know them all, I'll send you a free Tesla. No, I won't, that was a lie. Okay, so a few more quick stats. By 2050, over 70% of Americans are going to live in urban areas. And these are places with greatly diminished green spaces, especially in lower income areas or areas um, that are generally underserved. Plants clean air and water and soil, reduce stormwater runoff and cool structures. Views of complex nature increase the mental and physical health of school children, office workers, and patients in hospitals. Well-designed, diversified landscapes raise home values and actually spur community engagement while reducing crime. Um, having a prairie out front doesn't mean you're going to have a murderer hiding in the grass ready to jump out and go after you, but you're probably going to have a lot of wonderful insects in there. So we need to go from landscapes like this. This is acreage lots uh, just behind my house. That's where the Huskers lose their football games in the left middle. So we need to go from uh, landscapes like this to landscapes like this. You guys all know the nickname for the state capital. Usually I spot, speak with people around the country and uh, tell them what the nickname is. It's just so much fun. Anyway, did you know that this was originally supposed to be prairie? It wasn't supposed to be lawn. In the original plans, it was supposed to be prairie. So let's make that happen and do landscapes. Oh, that's a cool landscape. He might know this one. Uh, let's make it look like this. Let's go from these lot edges that can be quite massive and, and just, you know, the, the square acreage is just very significant when you think about, um, this is at UNMC. So, I mean, there's, there's so much of this business parks for sure. I've been ranting about that one lately and the mowing crew doesn't want to mow this. It's like a 45 degree angle. It's dangerous. It's scary. So let's make that look like this. I think that was last spring is what that would look like over at UNMC. Jones and something. I can't remember the other street. So more inspiration for you. Small fr uh, front bed we did for a client. Um, they sold their house and the new owners ripped this all up and put down grass. I mean, we're talking a four foot deep bed and it's gone. These gardens look good in autumn and winter. They don't stop, they don't lose their ecosystem service or an elite inner ecosystem purpose uh, once senescence and, and death comes along. Density is key. We can have these gardens in the shade too. There is, I know we, we, we think of prairie gardens as sun loving, but we can have shade meadows as well, as well. Meadow, prairie, it doesn't matter what the word is. This is a sedge meadow scape. Sedge are dominating in the first year. Forbes, the flowers will come along in, in years ahead. Here's a client that called me. They were putting in uh, uh, the solar panels and they did a geothermal well. And then they said, we don't want one square inch of lawn on, on our property. And I was like, cool, man, marry me. So the entire front yard is this and the entire backyard. It's even wilder back there. So we want to plant like nature when we are using native plants and, and trying to uh, create a, an echo of what used to be here before rampant uh, colonization occurred. So thick layered gardens using native plant communities. That means we're going to be increasing habitat and climate resilience to the landscapes. We have that thickness and density and mimic, mimic that thickness and density and diversity we see in wildness. Uh, it's also gonna minimize the need for weeding, mulching and watering. Uh, in our gardens, we're planting 12 inches on center. So all the plants are 12 inches apart, no matter how big they get, because our goal is to reduce weed pressure and conserve soil moisture and shade the soil ASAP. So when we're looking at layers, I'm stealing this from my friend's book. Um, it's because it's a wonderful illustration of, uh, uh, of how we put these natural gardens together and what the layers look like. So we have our ground cover layer. Um, some people call that green mulch or a matrix. It's usually warm season, bunch grasses, uh, sedges, uh, whatever. That tends to be tends to be a layer. It has your most biomass. And then we have the seasonal theme layer. So that's masses and drifts of flowers that are blooming at different uh, periods during the growing season. Then finally, we have the structural or, or architectural layer where it's tall perennials like Joe Pieweed, tall Coreopsis, uh, 
big shrubs, small trees, those sorts of things. And the, the, those would be the least numerous. So sort of savanna type in a way. So we want to study and learn from the wild native plant communities around us. And one of the things we learn is that we don't have sandhill cranes or prairie dogs or bison or anyone out there spreading wood mulch. So why do we apply wood mulch every year in our landscapes? Uh, wood mulch keeps plants in a perpetual state of establishment so they can't self sow and move around and fill in. And that's exactly what we want them to do. We want them to, 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 to fill in for us and give us free plants and provide that weed competition and so many of the uh, of the various ecosystem services that these natural landscapes provide. I don't remember what I was going to say about this slide, but you know, here's density, here's layers. The one on the the one on the right has drifts and masses of different forbs in a Seidoltz grama matrix green mulch ground cover. That's a that was a one acre lot, and we did about 25 foot deep bed around three sides of it in the backyard. So how do we do this? There's some really quick general design tips, uh, strategies to take. We're going to plant our flowers generally in drifts and masses. So think three, five, 15, 40 of a kind. It really depends on how large your landscape is, right? And this will help show design attention, especially when you repeat those masses and drifts. Now, some flowers, some forb species prefer to be individuals scattered around the landscape. Asclepius tuberosa is a prime example of that. You won't commonly see that in large groupings out in a prairie. It will tend to be scattered around a little bit. We also want to use paths, benches, arbors, and sculptures to invite humans in and show intention in the, in, into, this, into this space. Uh, I'm going to show you some of those later. Uh, when we're converting front yard lawns, I am very cognizant of my plant choice. Um, first, that's about choosing plants that are not aggressive. Uh, we, we, we don't want any plant species taking over the front yard and creating a monoculture or a quasi monoculture because then that starts to look weedy. Uh, we also focus on shorter plants, so plants that are generally two to three feet tall. Um, strange thing, strange thing about people, they don't like plants being taller than them, they feel intimidated, they certainly don't want plants touching them, flopping over into the sidewalk as they walk by with their dogs, so you know, we're really careful about that. Um, if we are using taller plants, they're going to be in the middle of the bed or the back of a bed, just like you would see in traditionally uh, design uh, garden spaces, horticulture. So there are a lot of elements in traditional horticultural design that we can use in a natural landscape that will be incredibly, be incredibly beneficial to helping people see the landscape as, as purposeful and hopefully help accept it a little bit more. Perfect example is this landscape bed right here in front of a client's home. Uh, generally, plants are two to three feet tall. The majority of them are two feet tall. The ones that get three feet tall are smack dab in the middle of this about three or 400 square foot bed. So there's Echinacea pallida in there, Anemone, uh, Anemone virginiana. Um, and then there's even some really, really tall Pycnathemum, I think virginianum there in the back that shouldn't be that tall, but, but there it is. I'm pretty sure this client put some, uh, so let's put some uh, plutonium in the soil. I just couldn't believe how, how well everything took off the first year, but they didn't. So there are several methods to converting your lawn um, uh, into this space, you know, where you, the, the, where you start, okay? And whatever method you use <coughs> um, is based on how much time you have, um, how much money you have, and just basically where your priorities are, right? You can do sheet mulching where you put cardboard down, you let it sit for a while, hopefully an entire year to get the maximum benefit out of it. Now the deal with sheet mulching is, I know most people put soil on top and then mulch, but then if you put soil on top, it's probably a rich soil and then that's making the soil, it's gonna eventually make the soil underneath too rich for plants. Um, a lot of our prairie plants don't like really rich soil conditions. They're gonna get too tall, flop over, have a shorter lifespan. Um, if you have 10,000 square feet, putting down cardboard across that entire space is really going to be difficult for you. Uh, so you can, you can solarize as well, putting plastic down. So you put plastic down for four weeks, take it off for two weeks. Uh, you let more weed seeds germinate. You put the plastic back on for four weeks, then you take it off for two, for two weeks, you let more weed seeds germinate. And this way you're exhausting the weed seed bank, so to speak. Uh, the problem with this is it's literally baking the soil life. It's frying them alive. And then you have a ton of plastic waste. What do you do? What are you going to do with all that plastic sheeting afterwards? Most people just throw it in the trash. I'm not a fan of that. You can rent a sod cutter. Um, 
that is going to prep the lawn immediately right away. You can cut the sod in the morning, plant the garden in the afternoon, but it's a lot of site disturbance. You're creating, you're exposing a lot of weeds to sunlight now, so they're gonna germinate like crazy. I am totally into as zero site disturbance as we can possibly get on establishing a garden because most of my clients are, are do-it-yourselfers. After we install, they manage the space. We're gonna stay in contact. They're gonna text us, we're gonna text them. Um, with questions and, and, and things like that. Um, but if we have too many weeds, they're gonna quickly get overwhelmed. So we're trying to do everything we can to reduce um, any weeds that germinate. And most, mostly it's things like crabgrass and foxtail, so annuals um, that are gonna diminish over time as the native plants fill in. Uh, the last option is the most controversial with most folks, but it's the option uh, I use the most because um, it's incredibly economical and it leaves the grass, it leaves the grass in place. So we just kill the lawn. It's about, it's usually ready to plant into two weeks later. We plant straight into the lawn. Um, sometimes we use a one inch mulch layer depending on a bunch of factors. Uh, but, and then that dead grass uh, provides uh, wonderful nutrients uh, to the soil underneath because, you know, as it breaks down. So usually one application is enough to take care of it. You can plan your garden any way you want to. I anymore just do it on site because I've, I, I come to know a lot about these plants and how they work together, but uh, your plan can look like uh, anything, anything you want it to. So here's some examples for you to think about using on your own. We definitely are fans of using plugs. Plugs are young plants, uh, immature plants that you can usually get in trays of 32 or trays of 50. We plant them 12 inches apart on most of our sites. Uh, okay, so these this is the size size difference, right? So when you go to most big box nurseries or lar larger local nurseries, they're going to have probably one gallon pots that are, God, what are they, about 15 or $20 now? Uh, that's a lot of money. And these nurseries are growing these, these plants, right? They are buying a plug, which costs them about a buck or something, and they're growing it in that gallon container and then charging you 15 times, 20 times more. So don't do that to yourself. Uh, we can get 2.5 inch plants, certainly from places like um, Nebraska Statewood Arboretum, Midwest Natives with Nathan down there. Uh, you can go to Izel Native Plants, I-Z-E-L. They are a, a middleman that works with native plant wholesalers all around the country to provide the right one, the, 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 the uh, tray on the right, that 50 plug tray, so you can get uh, all kinds of different plant species in 50s. So on the right, that's going to cost you about 120 bucks. The gallon container, again, is 15 to 20. That pot on the left is going to be somewhere between three and five dollars. If you do the math, you know, and you have a large space and you're on a tight budget, you can see where the win-win is here. Plus plugs are so much easier to plant, especially if you have clay soil, you're digging a much smaller hole. So it is a lot less stressful, especially if you're using um, an auger. So there you go, that's my plug uh, speech for the day. <laughs> Uh, so let's say you have a 100 square foot garden, uh, you're going to put your matrix level, your green cover, your, uh, your green mulch, your ground cover um, down uh, 12 inches apart. So this could be if it's in full sun, maybe you're using Budalua gracilis, blue grama. If it's shade, maybe you're using Carex albicans, white tinge sedge. So you get that down, you come in and then you do your masses and drifts of forbs. And this garden definitely needs more forbs in it, but it's just an example to show you how we do it, how we approach things. After installation, it's not that sexy, <laughs> but it will be in a year. So this is a 500 square foot front yard um, down on South Street here in Lincoln. Now, if you're going to be doing hundreds of plugs, don't use a spade, don't use a soil. Well, soil knife might be your next, uh, next best option, but the best option of all is using a mixing drill. Uh, if you have clay soil, you definitely want a mixing drill. You don't want a standard drill that you have in your house for, for small repair work, that, that motor will burn out, burn out really quickly. Mixing drills have higher torque and lower RPM. So we love to use these. Uh, we use all electric. We don't use quarter ones anymore. We use battery powered ones, but those are expensive. So we don't use fossil fuels anymore with our installations. So yeah, there's, your, there's an example of a very thin bed that employs a uh, green mulch. You can see Carex albicans there in the north side of this school. It's just a gorgeous plant. Um, the biggest labor your first year is definitely going to be addressing any weeds that pop up. Usually you just have to deadhead the weeds so they don't um, um, seed around. Deadheading is better than pulling because when you pull, you disturb the soil. And what happens when you disturb the soil? You create more opportunities for weeds to germinate because when you pull that plant out of the ground, weed seeds come up with that ball of soil and now they're on the surface and now they're ready to germinate. 
Um, if, if you are the do-it-yourselfer type, cues to care are so important when you are converting lawn. Um, I'm telling clients anymore that the easiest part is actually writing me the check and watching us install. The hardest part is then being an advocate for the landscape because you are destabilizing, you are destabilizing the status quo in your neighborhood, right? You are, you, if, you, if you are a zebra, you don't have stripes anymore. You're now fluorescent orange. You are standing out. Um, so, so you got to have these talks with neighbors, but there are some things, some design strategies we can take to hopefully smooth the waters, calm the waters a little bit. Having wide uh, access points, access paths in your landscape. This is our front yard at headquarters. We have a six foot wide uh, long path going up the middle that says, hey, come on down. You know, this is the price is right. Walk to the front door, walk around, see the plants, touch the plants. Uh, you can have access. Here's the papillion landscape we did last year. Um, clients uh, marked off these beds for us, uh, came in and sprayed the lawn. Uh, so it just, again, it gives, it, it gives people access. It shows intention to the space. They even went ahead and put a fire pit in the middle. So it's even more intention. It doesn't matter if it's really in the backyard or the front yard because definitely have neighbors complain if it's in the backyard too. But, you know, I'm thinking of the hundred or so landscapes we've done the last few years, I think just Two that I can think of off the top of my head have created any issues um, as far as neighbors being uh, reporting neighbors to weed control authorities. But again, it's all about cues to care. It's helping people see the space as intentional and having some traditional elements to it, like this wonderful stone pathway client put through their sedge, shady sedge meadow. Arbors, uh, fountains, sculptures, artwork, these are all cues to care that show that the space is intentional and planned and designed. And that goes hand in hand with choosing plant species that aren't aggressive. Again, especially this is important for the front yard and, and plant species that tend to be a little bit shorter, a little bit more stout. Sitting areas, again, lawn pathways, there's sculpture. I think that's got about every cue to care I can think of in this image. Signs are incredibly important. My local weed superintendent told me one time that uh, when they have signs on a landscape that is a more natural landscape, they tend to have very, very few complaints by neighbors. So uh, your sign should not be as wordy as this. This is a sign at the University of Nebraska Medical Center. I actually think this is a fantastic sign. It's one of the best ones I've ever seen, but it's definitely more of a learning space, right? It's on a university campus. If it's a neighborhood, it should not have very many words at all on it. So people can just do a quick read by as they're walking, walk on the dog. Somebody here made these cool signs. Tyler can tell you about those. I made my own too that you can download and have printed up um, at a local sign shop over at my Etsy, Etsy page. Signs go a long way. So let's talk about management here um, as we get uh, towards the end. I think this is towards the end of my talk. This is a shortened version of an 80 minute talk I gave last week. So I didn't know exactly how long this, this one was going to go. So lawns can seem a lot easier to manage because we grew up with them, right? We grew up with our parents saying, you know, all right, Jennifer, go outside and mow the lawn. I've had it, you know, you're gonna go do that chore. Uh, we mow every week at the same height. We water, we probably have um, set and forget sprinklers. Even if we get an inch of rain, the little sprinklers still come on. Uh, we fertilize on a schedule when the TV and radio ads tell us to. Too often, that's four times a year. That's probably way too much. You should be doing soil tests to see if you even need fertilizer or what you need to have done to the lawn. But we all know what you really need to have done to the lawn is to have it killed. Managing a more diverse garden, though, uh, in comparison to lawns, means that you have to know the plants a little bit more. And that takes time. You have to let the plants teach you, let them show you what they want, and be willing to go with the flow as the landscape changes month to month and year to year, because it's never going to look the same. And we don't want it to look the same. You know, this is exciting and cool uh, when the landscape uh, changes. Uh, design a lot of spaces where we have early successional flowers and annuals and biennials who steal the show the first two years until the more longer term herbaceous perennials come online and take over. Um, and then the uh, early succession species just naturally fade away. This is what we want. A natural garden is not more work than lawn. It's often a lot less in a few years, especially if you've chosen the right plants from the start. And the right plants are about soil and sunlight conditions, but it's also about matching plants to one another, um, especially with the rates of how they spread and how fast they grow. 
All right, I want to talk about spring cleanup a little bit because it's that time of year and because this is sort of a, a crawl on my side. <laughs> Uh, so various, it's not about air temperature. There's a meme going around right now that says, hey, once it starts, once it's at 50 degrees every day during the day, then you can clean up your landscape. I mean, I guess that's good enough for most people, but it's not really very accurate if you, if you, if you want to have maximum support for the wildlife in your landscape, because various fauna wake up at different times throughout the growing season. Uh, many native bee species time their life cycle around specific genera or species of flowering plants, like I told you 20 minutes ago, they're specialist bees. So they are waking up at all different times, April, May, June, July even. Um, and you certainly don't want to walk on any of your beds in springtime at any time if you can help it, because you could be crushing uh, queen bumblebees, adult morning cloak butterflies, amphibians, beetles, bugs, um, all that good stuff. Plus you could be compacting wet clay soils and you certainly don't wanna be doing that. We don't need our clay soils compacted anymore. But if you're putting in a bunch of native plants uh, with a lot of density and layers, their roots are gonna naturally amend that clay soil over time anyway. But the big question is, do you really need to clean up? I mean, why, right? There should be management goals. Cleaning up your spring garden shouldn't just be like cleaning up the family room after the kids go to bed at night. Um, well, I stopped doing that, I just gave up. Uh, so your, one of your management goals could be to remove diseased material, which is uh, something you should have done in the fall. Uh, you might want to be helping sunlight to reach the soil so you have more flower seed germination. Uh, if it's a front yard landscape, you probably want to think about tidying it up to appease neighbors to show that, yes, you are managing and taking care of this space. And just as they're doing their springtime chores, you are doing yours as well, and you're all in sync together. So show that active intention and management. Uh, Colleen, Elaine, Heather, and Sarah put this wonderful graphic together. Um, showing you how to cut down stems, how to leave some stems for the 25% or so of native bee species that nest in, in cavities, um, how long to leave those stems. So if you're cutting back stems to 12 inches this spring, you wanna leave those stems all the way through next year. So it's, it's a long period. Um, new spring plant growth um, quickly covers up these stems. Uh, so if it's unsightly to you, it won't be for long, especially once May hits. So uh, as, we, as we approach the end here today, uh, I just wanna say, do this. Don't be, don't be afraid and don't think it's, it's overwhelming. Um, well, maybe it is overwhelming, but who cares? <laughs> You're gonna learn so much once you just jump in and get started. These gardens are beautiful in summer. They're, they're even more beautiful in fall. I think fall has to be my absolute favorite time for these natural uh, landscapes that I'm sharing with and talking to you about today. Uh, winter is a close, close second. That wonderful ice we had yesterday, I got some wonderful shots. This is hoarfrost or freezing rime or freezing fog, whatever you want to call it. If you are lucky enough to live on a larger lot, um, then you certainly, I feel like you almost have a responsibility to not have, to, to, to remove as much lawn as you possibly can, because I very highly doubt that you have a soccer pitch out back um, that a national sports team is using. Besides, kids don't really need lawn. They need diversity. Um, they need to be in touch with nature. They need to be exploring. They need to, my son goes in the backyard and makes potions in a Frisbee disc using petal, uh, flower petals and seed heads and, and, and leaves and all kinds of things he finds. And he's out there getting exposed to all sorts of beneficial microbes, which will hopefully lessen his risk for developing allergies um, in his youth. So there's all kinds of wonderful benefits. Lawn is just, they kick a ball around for 10 minutes and then they're done. Uh, backyard meadow, they're out there for hours, lost in a world of creativity and empowerment. So let's rethink pretty in our suburban landscapes. You might be the only one, but that's okay. That just means you're ahead of the curve. Uh, my local weed superintendent and one of his lead inspectors, when I was talking with him one time, said, uh, you know, it's just a matter of time before we can no longer support lawns. I think that time is coming within the next, certainly within the next 20 years, probably within the next 10 years, where we're just not going to have the water resources to be wasting so much on lawns that we don't use, that we don't eat. And I am with you. I will always be with you. I stand in solidarity. So I stand in solidago with you. We're in this together. If you don't know who I am, you know who I am now, but hopefully you will read my book, uh, New Garden Ethic. This is a very deep, very dense philosophical why to all of this. Uh, my new book has been out um, about 
six or seven weeks now doing quite well are quite fortunate with how well it's doing. Um, this is the how. So it's a very practical introductory. It's not overwhelming at all. It's not for experts, it's for beginners. Um, so anyway, this is what I offer at my website. I have 18 online classes. If you wanna check them out, garden design community, uh, do it yourself, self-paced workshop, um, all, all kinds of wonderful free and paid resources. Uh, I hope you'll enjoy exploring that. So if we have any questions, I will attempt to answer them. I don't know if anybody is going to go through, I can't see up there how many, I think it's just a couple of questions. I can look at the chat or you can do it for me or you guys can just speak. Yeah. So the first question we have is from Carrie, and she was wondering where we could get signs uh, that you mentioned previously. Um, I know Tyler sells some, or he used to. Um, you can download the PDFs off of my Etsy Etsy site and have them printed up at a local shop, or you can go and buy them from places like uh, the Wild Ones, Xerxes Society, Pollinator Partnership. Um, Oh, what are some others? I bet Audubon has some signs. You know, a lot of these places have signs ranging from like twenty to fifty dollars. Let's see, and then Carrie, who is not on the chat anymore, but um, she is going to uh, be watching the recording uh, about the sociability of plants. This is an extremely helpful tool. Is this a new rating or standard in the industry, or is something you developed or both? It's so cool. I, it's been amazing the last week. So I've, well, I've been giving a lot of talks lately, but I feel really like in the last week, people have really been interested in this idea. So I think I'm gonna have to give another presentation focused on that. Um, I did last year, but I haven't offered it this year. Yeah, so, so the sociability index is on a scale of one to four. And most people have never heard of it. Uh, usually it's just, you know, some of us natural garden design folks that, that, that tend to hear, to hear about it. I definitely talk about it in my book, Prairie Up, and go into a lot of depth. I have an online class about it, but basically it's a scale of one to four. So level one are plants that are basically behaved clumpers. They just sit there. You know, they might grow, you know, they'll get taller in the second and third year, but they're not going to spread very much. Level two, they'll self sow around a little bit, run by root a little bit. Uh, maybe the grass clump just slowly gets bigger every year. Level three, sociability are plants that are you definitely going to start popping out, popping around, uh, popping up around the landscape, giving you little surprises. Level four mm -hmm. is, man, they are aggressive. Um, they might not totally take over, but, you know, they are going to, they are going to colonize. I'm thinking like Pacara aurea. Um, is a species golden ground swell that will certainly colonize, especially if it's a loamy soil with consistent moisture. Um, they will love that. So, but you know, this sociability index, you know, is is based in part on your site conditions. So some plants could be far more aggressive in a in a part shade, loamy, moisture rich uh, uh, soil. But you put them out into a sunny clay site with a lot of plant competition, especially in the root zone, they're going to be a lot more behaved. A plant that's more behaved in a sunny uh, competitive site would be like Conoclinium cholestinum, blue mist flower. Uh, uh, you know, it's, it's, you put it in with a bunch of bunch grasses like Cytotes grama or blue grama, it's far more behaved, uh, especially if it's in a clay soil. So there are a lot of nuances to this, but I think it is a fantastic way to think about. The only problem is you're not going to find these information on a plant tag. Uh, it's 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 through experience, it's through collating information based on all kinds of guidebooks and websites that you've come to trust as authorities in the subject material and the subject matter. Um, there is not a book out there that says, "All right, here's 100 native plants for your eco region, and here's their sociability index." Um, that just doesn't mm -hmm. exist, unfortunately. Uh, Carrie has uh, a question. Hi, thanks. So we have a patch of buffalo grass that I've never been able to have go border to border because there's a there's a surround of a bush that makes shade in a certain area, and then everything that uh, people buy to put in their lawns grows there instead of my buffalo grass. So I was wondering if that would work to put the sedge that you talked about being shade loving around where the bushes are so that could go out to where the buffalo grass is, but maybe not invade the buffalo grass. Yeah, don't don't worry about invasion. Buffalo grass is going to be more aggressive than any of the sedges I recommend to you. So I'm going to give you the scientific plant names because it's more accurate. Uh, common names could reflect, you know, could reflect 10 different plant species. So Carex albicans, Carex springalii, um, Carex abernia, 
those would be species I would look at. And it looks like we have a question from Mike. Um, what's the typical approach to do with the prior lawn sprinkler sprinklers, sprinklers in place? Convert to low pressure, remove all together, or leave in place and try off? Yeah, you could just leave them in place and turn them off. I mean, the cool thing about lawn sprinklers is, uh, you know, if you're installing the garden in May and then June, July, and August is really hot, you've got a backup system built in. You don't have to pull out hoses and, and, and uh, oscillating sprinklers or something like that. But yeah, you're not going to need it. Um, certainly not after the first year, not if you've chosen your plants correctly and matched them uh, well to the site, you're not going to need them anymore. So you can cap them or you can just never turn the system on again. Uh, that's how it is at our house. Some, some sprinkler heads we've capped. Um, I haven't had the system on for like seven years. So it does work though. I had to turn it on last year for one thing. So luckily most of the heads popped up. Do we have any other questions from the group? Hi, this is Carrie again. Um, are the native plants mold resistant? We've had a lot of moles in our yard. Uh, I see moles. Moles are tunneling in your in, in the ground, and they're they are they are they are meat eaters, right? They're not plant eaters. Um, I see I see moles as not a pest or a problem, but as beneficial because they're turning over the soil, they're aerating the soil naturally for us. They're like ants in that way. So, you know, if you have I know you said you said you you said you have a, a buffalo grass lawn, so you're going to notice mold damage a lot more than if you had a Budula gracilis or Budula cryptopendula or Schizocyrium scoparium little blue stem lawn, uh, which are taller grass species. So you're certainly going to notice mold damage a little bit more. But I encourage you to not think of it as damage; just think of it as, "Wow, this is awesome! They are aerating and improving the soil." Um, I'm glad you guys are here. I know that can be hard to do but I encourage you to think about it that way if you can. Anybody else? Those are good questions. I'm surprised we had that many since we just have 14 folks here today. Uh, not that it's super relevant, uh, Ben, but I, back in my youth, I worked on a, uh, golf course as a grounds crew member for five summers. So we were the people that were destroying all the grass and mowing it down. So I feel, <laughs> I feel, I feel that. <laughs> well, you, you, you can atone for it now, right? Later in life. <laughs> I, I can atone for my sins of my youth. <laughs> You know, there are a lot of things that we all used to do. I used to do a lot of things that I can't believe I did. And certainly you just, well, you just learn. This is just a natural learning process and it can, it can take time. And, you know, if your plants die, that's not a big deal. You've, you've learned a lot of information from those plants that died. Nobody has a brown thumb. Just keep taking risks and experimenting and letting the plants show you what they want to do. Just don't, just don't spray for, for insects and things like that. Well, if we don't have any other questions, um, I would just like to thank you for uh, presenting to us today, um, Ben, and thank you to everybody to coming uh, to the talk. Well, thanks, you guys. Uh, good luck this spring. And if you have any further questions, feel free to send me an email or whatever you want to do. Have a good day, guys. All right. See you.